This is my Surface Pro 3. I know, you're here to see the framework, but I want to start here. I got it in winter 2014 and it's been my daily driver ever since. Literally daily use. Three novels, essays and blog posts, drawings, CAD modeling, games, movies, video editing. It has held up remarkably well. I love this thing. It's a carefully crafted, vertically integrated, proprietary experience. Now, I'm replacing it with its polar opposite, and I could not be more excited. This is my new framework laptop, or rather it will be in a few minutes. See, Framework is a different kind of laptop manufacturer. They make fully modular, highly configurable, user-serviceable, user-repairable laptops. They're built to work on Windows and Linux out of the box, and they open source all sorts of their stuff. This is the DIY edition, which means that some components come pre-installed, but you can customize most of what's inside. My configuration, as ordered, includes a 12th generation Intel i5, 500GB of NVMe storage, and 32GB of RAM. Eagle-eyed viewers will see that this has already been opened before. Yes, this is not a fresh unboxing, but I wanted to share the process with you, so I've dismantled it to do it again. Framework doesn't want any unnecessary waste, so in the DIY edition you can choose to order or not order any components. In my case, I have 65 watt power adapters all over this house, so I didn't order Frameworks charger. I also have a Windows license, so I chose not to buy a new one. If I'd had compatible RAM or an SSD, I could have skipped those too. So here's the computer itself, a nice tight package to house the 13 and a half inch screen in the correct aspect ratio for laptops, which is three by two, same as my dearly departed surface. It doesn't feel larger or heavier than other laptops in this class really, which I wasn't expecting. Nice big framework icon and gloss black. The matte aluminum feels kind of soft to the touch, and I swear it's got an almost heathered appearance in some light. I don't know if that's because the chassis is 50% post-consumer recycled aluminum, or just the machining process they used. Either way, gorgeous finish. The design is a little bit industrial, with sharp corners and large flat slopes instead of gentle curves. None of the edges are too sharp, but they're approaching almost too sharp, if you get me. They feel precise and machined in a good way. Here we go, let's get into the laptop now. Screwdrivers in the box, only tool you need to use. Five screws, and we can lift off the keyboard deck. These screws all stay attached to the case, so you don't have to keep a parts tray nearby. This fifth one makes a click and then stops coming out, so you know you're good to go. That screw also shows the corner you can start with when you open the case. The corner pops up a little so you can get a fingernail or the spudger on the back of the screwdriver in there to lift. There's resistance when you lift off the deck. Magnets keep it in place so that even when you've unscrewed everything, it doesn't fall apart. It is both very satisfying and a little scary to pull it off. Now, you need to be a little careful so you don't pull the keyboard's ribbon cable out, but you can lift the whole top deck off to give you access to everything. Look at that, everything is just laid out in front of you. There are QR codes on everything that in theory take you to guides and replacement parts. I haven't scanned everything, but several of these QR codes just kind of take me to a page talking about what the QR codes are for, which seems unnecessary. One, sure. Multiple, no. When the QR codes take you where you expect to go, it's a much better experience. A plus idea with a bit of B plus implementation, in my opinion. Okay, first things first, the SSD. Little baby NVMe drive goes in right here, 500 gigs, ready to go. Then RAM, starting from slot zero. One 32 gig stick here with room for another. I'd actually need another pretty soon. Stay tuned to learn why. Oh, I like this. The team has a little shout out. Made with love, yeah, <laughs> I could tell. So that's all the do it yourself I really need to do myself for the DIY edition. 
Let's get the case reattached here and then we can install the expansion cards. I went maybe a bit boring on this first round of expansion cards, two USB-C and two USB-A for docks and peripherals mainly. Uh, the USB-C supports the USB 4 standard, charging obviously, and as of the next BIOS update, Thunderbolt as well. The USB-A ports will give me USB 3.2 speeds. This should do for now, but I think I may grab an Ethernet and an HDMI expansion card soon. These cards just slot into the bottom and lock in place. You can release the locking mechanism with the little button next to the cards. I, I cannot believe how quick and easy it was to get the computer open and get parts installed, and how satisfying the hardware is to handle. The out-of-box experience was not difficult but not seamless so far as setting up Windows goes. It was extremely fast to install the OS from a good USB 3 drive, no problem there. However, Framework needs you to manually install drivers for the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, trackpad, and fingerprint scanner, among other things. That means, during the Windows setup process, I couldn't sign into my Microsoft account, start syncing OneDrive, or activate Windows. I had to create a local account, then install the driver pack from the website via USB, and then manually punch in my product key. The one other hang-up I had was that I wasn't able to upgrade from Windows 10 to 11 via Windows Update, despite having compatible hardware and TPM 2.0 enabled. I had to download a Windows 11 installer. Not a deal breaker, but a little surprising that I needed to go through that extra step. At time of recording, I've been using the framework for just shy of a month, so I'll give some impressions from setting up and starting to use it as my daily driver. After the fresh Windows install, the new drivers and the upgrade to Windows 11 things went very smoothly. The 12th Gen i5 seems like plenty of power for most users. It sails through everyday tasks like web browsing and office apps. It has no problem with GIMP or Inkscape. It didn't miss a beat with Fusion 360. It does screen recording with OBS fine in the desktop environment, but struggles if I'm running 3D games more complicated than, say, Minecraft. And this video plus one other was edited and rendered on the framework as well using Shotcut, and it did great. One other no negative of the framework is that the battery life is kind of mediocre. I've found it more than adequate for my purposes thus far, but I have yet to really go anywhere with it, so I'm always near a charger. I have the sneaking suspicion that my take might change abruptly someday, but for now, I have no complaints. One other thing that I found quite frustrating is that I actually configured my DIY edition wrong to take full advantage of the 12th gen Intel i5 and all its features. See, my original configuration had just one giant 32 gig stick of RAM. Problem is, Intel's XE graphics require dual channel memory to work. So when I was trying to benchmark and play some games, a Civ 6 in this case, it just chugged to a halt, falling back to Intel UHD graphics. This was fixed by installing a second stick of RAM. I was certainly glad that I had the option, but I was a little frustrated that it was assumed that I would have that granular knowledge when configuring my DIY edition. Framework put a little warning on the website if somebody only puts one stick of RAM in their card, okay? I see in the forums that I am not the only one who's done this. That said, I was pretty happy to have an excuse to crack open the laptop again. Now, I am not planning on really gaming on this laptop, and in the couple of older games I did try, it did a more than adequate job. I keep your expectations calibrated that this is a laptop without a dedicated GPU, and I think you'll probably be pretty happy. Now, the fan spins up hard and fast when you're downloading and installing things or when you're doing GPU-intensive tasks. This is the case both on power and off with UHD and XE. I don't mind a fan to be honest, but it's just a hair louder and quicker to turn on than I'd like. Go on the forums, go on Reddit, there are fixes out there to adjust the fan speed curve and reduce the overall noise. I suppose I prefer fan noise to thermal throttling, but it's a bit of a weird trade-off. We've mentioned graphics a couple of times, so let's talk about the display. It is really beautiful. It's got this tall 3 by 2 aspect ratio at 2256 by 1504. I know this is a very specific thing to be excited about, but text rendering at that high resolution is so crisp. I really love writing on it because of that. 
colors are nice and vibrant. I think it's got full sRGB and it gets plenty bright enough during the day and plenty dim at night. Now I said writing, which means that it's time to talk about the keyboard. It's got good key travel and the chiclet style keys are comfortably spaced out. It's a little softer and less clicky than either my Surface Type cover or my ThinkPad from work. Both the generous key spacing and the lack of snap to the key press resulted in a little bit of a learning curve, but by now I have completely adapted. Right beneath the keyboard is a trackpad. It's big and glass and clicky. It feels very responsive and accurate to use. The webcam is 1080p and does a pretty respectable job in decent lighting conditions. It's got some aggressive auto exposure that does an okay job keeping up with lighting changes. As the light gets dimmer, we see some color accuracy start to get lost and then a dip in saturation and a lifting of RGB noise. It's a webcam on a laptop, but it's a good one. I haven't spent a ton of time with the microphone. I actually had a defective microphone, but I had the best customer service experience I have ever had. <laughs> Working with Framework, they sent me a brand new webcam module and it took five minutes to install. Listen, let me sum up. This is a really fantastic and very interesting laptop that is thus far suiting my purposes very nicely. If you're looking for a gaming or streaming PC, this likely isn't it. You knew that already though. But if you're looking for a very solid, all-round laptop that doesn't necessarily need all-day battery life, then yes. It is a fascinating device that invites tinkering, and I already feel more like it's mine than my Surface Pro 3 that I've spent the last eight years with. Even though there wasn't a ton of assembly required, this feels like a device I own, and that has value to me. I also don't want to discount the value that I get out of voting with my wallet here. Framework's stated goals include reducing e-waste and proving to the industry that user serviceable, repairable, and upgradable devices don't have to be bulky or ugly or niche, and that's really laudable. The Framework Laptop DIY Edition with Intel 12th Gen. A really great but imperfect laptop that compels me to spend more time with it and that aligns with my values. Is it the last laptop I'll ever own? Will this be the laptop of Theseus, where I replace parts incrementally forever? Framework is way too young a company to tell. But at this point, my position is that so long as they're around, so am I. Thanks for sticking around. I'm Trevor. You've been watching Love Make Share. Hope you learned something. Hope you've been inspired. Now, go make something. <laughs>